So, uh, good morning to everybody. Nice being here after such a long time. Uh, good morning to my panel. Thank you all for being here. We hope that you will uh, shine your expert light on the matter of growth and development of the servicing market. And who better to do this? Let me introduce, starting with the lady in, on the panel. Just not to get the titles wrong, because it happened once. So we have Alexandra Fatzea. She's the general manager in retail, SB and Agri Recovery at Intrum. Welcome, Alexandra. Thank Good you for morning. being here. Very happy to be here. Thank you. We have Frixus Ioannidis, Chief Servicing Officer at Quant. Right, Nikos? I think we're okay. Thank you. Thank you, Frixus, for being here. We have Steve Lennon. He's the founder and CIO at Phoenix Asset Management, Italy, PAM. Welcome. And finally, we have Dimitris Vlachos. He's the founder and CEO at DVO1 Asset Management here in Greece. Thank you very much, Dimitri, for being thank here. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so um, I had pl planned an opening with a lot of numbers, and I will give you some of them. Um, we lawyers are infamous about our relationship with numbers, but I will try, and then I will uh, finish with one word that stuck in my mind from the speech of Mr. Saikouras, because he repeated it again and again, and I think it has a strong connection to what we are going to say next. So, we are talking about the growth and development of uh, the Greek servicing market. Let's see where we are right now. Since 2017, uh, we've had many deals that have been completed, both as regards the portfolio sales and securitization deals. And these deals amount to almost 52 billion euros. And if we think about it, last year, 2021, which was a difficult year for many, many reasons, the respective deals amounted to almost 42 billion euros. This is very, very impressive. And right now we're standing here for 2022 and we have many more things to wait for both in the, the, let's say, primary market, if we can call it this way, and also in the secondary market, which is uh, a notion that we have come to know and love. Uh, having said this, uh, the word that I want to, uh, to repeat is the word sustainable and sustainability. Mr. Stikuras mentioned it many times, sustainable development, the resilience, sustainability. And I think this notion has a strong connection to the development of the servicing market. Uh, the people we have on our panel are real experts because they all come from servicers and they will all give us a different insight as regards the challenges and the opportunities uh, for the servicing market, for the secondary market, for the digital transformation uh, and everything else. So without further ado, Alexandra, I'd like to start with you. Can you please give us the way you see the opportunities that rise in the servicing market right now? Well, thank you very much, Olga for the introduction, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, first of all, let, let me say that these are peculiar times that we live in. Um, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, we were um, up against an unprecedented crisis with COVID. Um, we managed quite well, I would say, especially in our, in our market, given the, the circumstances, and we thought that this would be over quite soon. So two years later, we're up against a triple, let's say at least, crisis. And at the moment, we have soaring prices um, because of the, the energy price increase in Europe. We have new COVID lockdowns in China, and we have a US inflation that is causing huge problems. So the entire world uh, is changing again, and it's causing us challenges again that we need to, to face. When it comes to the Greek market, I would say that the word resilience that the minister mentioned um, clearly characterizes us. We have been resilient, we have been able, uh, and maybe contrary to, to what many would believe, we have been able to manage the, the recent crisis, and we have been able to do this by transforming the NPL market. Um, so with the, the introduction of servicers, we now have a, a frame where we have a market, a regulated market, where experts operate in. Uh, challenges are there, but I would say that we are ready. We, are, we have the, the adequate knowledge and expertise. There are new things that will come up, like the secondary market, of course. This is within our business plans for securitizations. For example, us in, in Tintrum, 
we have securitized six portfolios, 16 billion euros in the last few years, a huge number of uh, NPLs. And we are currently investigating the, the way to move this forward. Uh, so I would say that the, the current market um, is more able than never to, to face the current environment. Also, our debtors are much more mature. They're much more willing to, to cooperate and to find solutions. And let us not forget that we have the uh, adequate and the necessary regulation, the jurisdictional uh, system, the framework, the new law of second chance. Um, as a lawyer, you must understand how important it is to have ensured minimum uh, times in the uh, auction, let's say, uh, process and the judicial uh, process that was cumbersome in, in Greece. So yes, challenges are there, new things are, are coming up, but I think that we are in a much better environment, much more prepared and ready to face mm -hmm. these new challenges. Okay, so I understand the message you're leaving us with is optimistic. You are ready for what comes next. Yes, the challenges are there. Yes, we know them, but we are ready and we are prepared for all scenarios, the good ones and the bad ones. Absolutely. If you, if you read the newspapers, the uh, Greek and international, everybody speaks about a, a possibly new wave of, of red loans. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say that there's no reason to panic, first of all. We haven't seen any, any huge... Uh, a uh, surge of uh, non-performing loans at the moment. And this is, of course, uh, explainable. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the energy increase, the soaring prices have not hit the disposable income that much. Mm -hmm. uh, it's at approximately 8 to 9%. So this explains why the individuals that have um, a bit more savings than in the past due to COVID are able to, to continue repaying their loans. So we have not seen any um, let's say, increased wave of non-performing loans. But yes, we are prepared. We have plans. Uh, and this is a good thing about having servicers operate in the market and manage the non-performing loans. This is what we do. This is what we are experts in. Um, so we are prepared for the worst, but we are quite optimistic, especially given the fact that the Greek economy is about to experience a very good uh, period due, uh, due to the tourism and the income that the tourism is going to generate. So the prospects are, are, good. are good. And this is something that is also evident in the Commission's statement, European Commission mm -hmm. statement. Um, I, I am optimistic, yes. Right, thank you. Uh, Frixos, um, how do you feel about the challenges that Alexandra raised? Do you agree? Are there any more challenges? And what about opportunities? How does Quant see that? I, would, I, I agree totally with the fact that uh, we have a very resilient environment. Uh, I think generally Greeks are a re resilient lot. Uh, we've been through a lot of things. I'm uh, in this market since uh, when the, the subprime uh, loan crisis started. So in this period, a lot of major events uh, occurred. Um, you know, we had a double crisis of uh, Greece participation in the Euro, uh, we had uh, Brexit, uh, then we had uh, the COVID situation, and now we have a European war. Uh, and what this amounts to is a generalized level of uncertainty. All these uh, localized crises that in the past would take five to ten years to become a global phenomenon happens now over, uh, overnight. Uh, and uh, this, I think, showed that as a market, we're quite resilient. There is another reason, of course, which is that we are not at the top level of our performance. So even when bad things happen, we're still growing mm -hmm. because we are still learning and we are a quite young market. Uh, we have not reached a level where you know, there are not many things to improve. We have a lot of things to improve. And I think this, this is the opportunity, the opportunity that we have in front of us is that uh, after the NPL has moved out of the banks, mm -hmm. uh, we, we now have to focus on improving performance. And uh, uh, the fact that the economy is more resilient than we originally thought uh, gives us the opportunity to work with our processes, uh, with technology, 
uh, finding the right people, because this is a major challenge, I think, mm -hmm. nowadays, uh, in order to improve and further improve performance. Don't forget that, yes, bank books are better now, healthier, and uh, the deleveraging that happened is important, but a big part of the risk remains, uh, and uh, it uh, lies both with the banks and with uh, the Greek taxpayer. So we owe it to the Greek economy to do a better job, and I think that's the main challenge and the opportunity that we have ahead of us. Mm -hmm. I see. So you use the word resilience and also the word uncertainty. And you said there's still a lot to be done because we haven't reached our top level of performance. And then it was really interesting what you said about performance and how this presents a challenge. Performance with the resources, performance with the digitalization, with the specialization. So really interesting notion. Thank you, Frixos. Okay, going on to Steve, uh, coming right from Milan, we all envy you for that. I do, uh -huh. for one thing. So Steve, you come from PAM. Uh, you have a whole different experience from the Italian market. And um, yes, you, I know that you deal with the unsecured and secured loans. And we have our HAPs and you have your GACs. So can you please give us some insights on these and uh, compare the I Italian paradigm to the Greek paradigm? And what do you see for the future? Is it, is it an optimistic view? What can you say? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not negative. I mean, I think we're not active in Greece at the moment, as you know, but we, I think Italy potentially is a good parallel for the Greek market. I think probably we're experiencing things a few years ahead of what's happening in Greece. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just maybe just two words on the business. So we have circa 9 billion euros of assets under management, typically secured corporate SME, really where there's a high level of legal complexity or, or true workout positions. Um, we founded the business back in 2014. It's an independent platform, but we do have now some institutional shareholders who also work in Greece. So PIMCO is one of them, and they've been quite active uh, in Greece. Uh, and, and, and Anacap is another, which is a smaller UK fund. So we see a lot of parallels. Um, what are the challenges? I mean, I think it's hard to talk about the way the servicing market has evolved without ref referring to the government-backed schemes, as you correctly said. Um, I remember speaking at this conference a few years ago when we were just starting in the GACs process and, and you hadn't quite started the HAPS, mm -hmm. uh, trying to outline some of what I, what I saw as the risks. And I think from what I see, you know, the HAPS program takes it maybe even a step further in some of those elements where I see potential risk, or, or not so much risk, but slight distortion of the market in the mm -hmm. sense that I think, you know, the government-backed program, I think it's a, a case of you know, the worse the illness, the stronger the medicine. And I think Italy and Greece have been um, unique in receiving this additional helping hand, let's say, from the sovereign. And I think that always comes at a bit of a price. So I really would look at it in terms of, I think you made a very good point at the end of, of what you just said, which is, you know, what, what do we really think the GACs can achieve? I mean, if we were looking at the GACs as a solution to the NPL problem, then I think that's not what it is. If we're looking at it as a solution to take the distressed assets off the bank's balance sheets, put them somewhere else mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. And I think it did a good job in that. I mean, mm -hmm. if you think about, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think there's in excess of, you know, clearly in excess of 100 billion euros of transactions in Italy with the GACs and really against tens of millions or maybe hundreds of millions of equity. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very thinly uh, supported by credit enhancement. So it's a very leveraged structure. Uh, the underlying portfolio is still the same. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole bunch of costs that have gone on top of this. So it's not magically performing better. We've taken that, we've put it somewhere else. We've got the banks healthier, which is great because the banks fuel the economy and they need to lend you money. So I think that's, uh, you know, obviously makes sense. But now really, like you said, I think we need to understand how to resolve the NPL issue. And, you know, against that, you know, nearly 200 billion of deleveraging, there's really, you know, tens of millions of collections. So there's clearly a lot of uh, work to be done. Um, uh, so yeah, I think w one of the challenges maybe, and then, then we can move on to something else, is is making sure that uh, the portfolios that have come out of the bank's balance sheets have done so a lot of the time via GACs. Mm -hmm. And so I think we need to ensure that wh whoever's managing those portfolios is really incentivized to maximize recoveries and not simply chasing down triggers every quarter, making sure that they, they don't hit their triggers. Let, let me give you an example. I mean, paradoxically, 
what we've seen, I mean, we took more of a niche route, so we don't play in the primary GAX market today. We just, we waited a little bit. We've actually invested our own capital. We bought a GAX, so we hold a mezzanine and junior note in one of the Italian GAX, in particular, the only one that doesn't have subordination of the mez. So it's an interesting investment for us also to get closer to the, um, closer to the operations. But what we see is, paradoxically, you know, services can be under pressure to meet their business plan, underperforming against their business plan, and therefore, you know, accessing last minute sales, other kind of uh, opportunities, which don't necessarily maximize the end of generation returns or help that loan recover or restructure that loan or help the economy in that way. Even worse, what I think is happening is we've been advising a lot of investors who, who, um, who are investing into GACs. And what we've been saying is, listen, yeah, of course, when you're underperforming, when you have a DPO resolution, which is below business plan, then it's an evident issue. But really what you're not seeing is when you have a business plan that's a little bit conservative and you're meeting that business plan, but you're probably still losing value mm -hmm. because you probably could have done more on that position. Mm -hmm. So there's been a conservative buffer potentially built in. So it's almost like the structure has aimed to maximize, obviously, attachment points on leverage and proceeds to the banks. But you've ended up with this difficult situation where you're not always incentivized to actually maximize the recovery. So you're missing your business plan, you're losing value. You're hitting your business plan and potentially you're losing value. So we just need to make sure that that's not happening. I see. Um, I see. Thank you. So gags, definitely not the solution to the NPL problem. Okay. So we'll see. <laughs> Not in that sense. <laughs> Not in that sense. Okay. Dimitri, coming to you, uh, we've talked a lot about the challenges and opportunities. Um, do you agree with what uh, has been said? Do you have something more to add? Um, yes. Let, let me start by the last uh, point that uh, Steve made. Um, I think the challenges that the services will be facing in managing all these uh, uh, hub structures in Greece, uh, I guess we'll follow the path that the um, Italian market has, uh, has done, maybe in a different way. Uh, we have not seen it happening yet, but uh, you know, it's one of the events that we may be facing with, and this means that there may be uh, delays in performing on the, uh, on the business plans. And it's a big issue, I, I believe, in the way that things have been structured in order to do a, you know, to get the rating and do the, the hubs thing is to um, you know, avoid seeing eventualities or things that happen during the management process that, you know, uh, hinder uh, the ability of any service actually to perform. I mean, COVID is one of these things, uh, you know, the U Ukrainian war is another thing. So in all these hubs processes, there's no adjustment process, and this is not good. I mean, if you, if you think that you need to manage five years on things that you sort of business planned five years before, you know, it's, it's not necessarily something that makes sense. So there has to be some sort of, um, you know, triggers adding to the points that uh, Steve made on, you know, when you're overperforming, um, maybe you're selling short and, may, and, and when you're underperforming, maybe you're not doing as, as a good job as, as you should. So that's one thing. Um, I, I do agree that, the, you know, for us services, the opportunities are there. Um, and the opportunities are there because um, as it has been said, the MPL problem has not been solved. Uh, the bank's problem has been solved in a significant way. So they have offloaded risk to some other, you know, to, to, to the state and to the services who, are, uh, who have undertaken to perform the business plans. Um, but the problems have not been solved. And I would like to sort of, uh, I think, although the opportunities are there, I'd like to point to some challenges. Mm -hmm. And uh, the challenges have been, you know, known for some time, and a lot of things have happened to sort of improve on some of those. Um, uh, I think, uh, for example, that the, uh, that the legal uh, environment has improved significantly. Uh, the second opportunity uh, law and also the judicial processes, the auction, <coughs> the auction reset, price resetting mechanism, etc. There are things that have sort of improved uh, on how we can do our job. Still, the I think the biggest challenge we face, especially we're doing a lot on corporate side rather than uh, um, personal or mortgages. Um, the, the way that the uh, judicial system works uh, still remains a, a bit of an issue. Um, and I can give you an example of that. Um, I, you know, getting some uh, decisions that are then overthrown by a different courts somewhere else in, uh, in, the, in the region. Um, so uh, there's a lot of Work, there is work to be done there, uh, not so much on the sort of legal framework, but on the 
actual performance of the uh, judicial process. Mm -hmm. I think another challenge that was mentioned in the previous panel is the financing part, because all these NPLs, in order, we all know that NPLs to be sorted, you need funding. And if you don't get funding, it's, it's, it's a problem. And I think the banks at the moment are not looking at that. There is a lot of opportunities that they are looking at, and maybe regulatorily as well, they are hindered in, in looking at the uh, NPL. So uh, this is something we believe seems to be missing in the, in the market. Um, and it's something that uh, needs to be addressed somehow. Uh, I don't know what the what still experience is in Italy, but I think it's something that we, we would certainly need to, to look into. Um, there is a lot of pressure under the regulation uh, and the, you know, the way that uh, services operate to actually uh, get a license to actually fund. Uh, I'm not sure this is, uh, this is the right way about it. Um, but um, anyway, it's, a, it's something that needs to be um, and there are a couple of other challenges, I believe, in terms of, uh, uh, for example, the tax, uh, the tax issue. Uh, I, when you, if you are, a, and that's more on the individual side, possibly, if you sort of get a, a discount on your loan, and you know, somebody tells you, you pay me now 20, or in five years' time, 20% of your outstanding, then you have a, a, a windfall game of 80%. What do you do with that, and how much tax do you pay for it? Uh, and that may come to play in some cases in the corporate side, but more in the, in the personal side. So I'll, I'll leave it there for the time being, but uh, I think it's a, it's a picture where, you have a, where we do have opportunities, and uh, we have opportunities to actually further develop the market, our capabilities, our approaches, and, 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 um, uh, and the way we, we perform our, 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 our tasks. Uh, but also there are some challenges to, to be faced. And just to mention one more thing is that I believe people that have been on the receiving side, i.e. borrowers, mm -hmm. of our services have been very pleased to see that there is a response. Mm -hmm. that what we have not, you know, what we have not, because the banks had a big problem to solve, and un until this is solved, the secondary level, which is re you know, solving the MPL problem, uh, is not easy to, to tackle. So we have borrowers that are now happy to hear feedback that comes fast, that is reasonable, that is based on, 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 on realities. We don't, any, anybody in this table, we don't think we can get money from, that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. We will only get assets and money or restructuring or two stuff that, uh, you know, makes sense. And this is the basis of our operation. I see. It is many, many interesting points you raised. So yes, the legislative adjustments that you, you mentioned are very, very important, and we hope to see in the future how they will apply. And uh, taking the inspiration from something you said, Alexandra, how can the servicers help uh, the clients, let's say, let's not say the debtors, the clients to be bankable again? What can you do in that respect? And maybe can you link into the secondary market if, if it is linkable? I don't know. This is a very interesting question, and listening to all four of us talk about numbers before, I thought, well, we are not to forget and, and not, not to, to underestimate our role in the economy as well, and the society, mm -hmm. because the debt is there. Um, we place it here and there in different vehicles, let's say, but the debtor is there and we need to give viable solutions. So one must not forget, especially our services, we must not forget that um, we have um, a significant role to play in the economy and the society. Mm -hmm. um, so talking about um, businesses, um, you know that Greece and, and is probably one of, the, um, one of the economies with the largest number of uh, very, very small enterprises as well, uh, very small and SMEs mm -hmm. operating in Greece. We have quite a few of them in our books uh, under the HAP scheme, but also under um, privately owned portfolios. And it's not just a matter of restructuring a loan and extending the duration or giving a very good haircut and pleasing the debtor right on the moment of the restructuring. What is really necessary is to, to help the business become bankable again, uh, be credit worthy again. Um, uh, let's say find a way to, to sustain the business, and I'm talking about viable businesses, of course, here, sustain the business, um, repay the loan, and be able to, to get uh, credit again. Uh, at Intrum, we, because we used to be uh, a banking unit with a huge portfolio of uh, small business loans, SMEs, and large corporates as well, we have kept this, this legacy and this knowledge 
um, of how to, to uh, prepare viable business plans and how to, to help our customers, our debtors, uh, to find a solution that can be repaid. So one thing that we do is that when we restructure a loan, we do not take the entire capacity to pay for the repayment of, of the obligations. We always leave some capital uh, for, the, for the operating needs uh, of the business. Another thing that we do, and I think we're the only ones in, in the market, it, is that we, through our consultants that we hire and we pay, we help them get funds from the national program. Uh, should, should, should we be saying this? Maybe you're giving out ideas. I don't know. No, they cannot do it. Okay. I mean, we're, it's, it's something really unique that we do. But no, I'm, I'm <laughs> kidding. I hope that all our, uh, let's say, service parties, um, they, they merged into such a thing because it really, it really helps the businesses to, to be able to get funds through this European uh, program, mm -hmm. uh, through this um, funding network called ESPA in Greek. The abbreviation in, in Greek is ESPA. So what we do, uh, we have our consultants guide them. Uh, this is, um, uh, let's say, a geographically specific and an industry specific uh, program. So we help, uh, we promote the, this program. We really cannot see where the money is going. We, we do not get a hold of the money, but we help the, the business uh, get access to the funds. Mm -hmm. um, and one, one number that, uh, that I can give you is that out of the 100 uh, debtors that we approach, 70% of them, they, they really get access to the money. Um, so we benefit uh, indirectly, not directly, but apart from the financial, let's say, benefit that we get, uh, we also get trust, and, and this is something really difficult to build. Mm -hmm. uh, but when, when one builds it, I think it really ensures that, the, that whatever agreement, whatever negotiation we, we have <coughs> will be done through good faith, uh, transparency, and will be a plan that will be mutually agreed to the benefit of, of each other. And for a long period of time. Absolutely, absolutely. So th these are, th I think, things that we can do. A, um, mind the business when we restructure, not be greedy. Mm -hmm. uh, B, uh, help them get um, access to funds. And of course, a third thing uh, is uh, help them get the benefit of the out-of-court workout, the law of the second chance. Uh, I think this is um, a huge benefit to the debtor to be able to get a solution for the first time that is transparent, uh, that is um, fair, that they can restructure the debt to the um, state, tax authorities and uh, secu uh, national security. Um, I think that th there are a few things that we can do that really change the game when it comes to helping them become bankable again. That's a very important process and impressive process you described for us. And I, I, was, uh, I particularly like the part that you said, uh, yes, you talk to viable businesses and you make sure that there is capital left for the business to run. So mm -hmm. that's a really viable solution. So Frixos, coming back to you, I still have in my mind uh, what you said before about the performance issue and how you linked it to resources and to specialization and maybe collaboration and the digital transformation. How do you put all this in the secondary market? Hmm. Don't hold back. <laughs> <laughs> well, the secondary market uh, is evolving partly because of the problems in performance. So, uh, and this had to do mostly with the uncertainty of the last uh, couple of years. Uh, so a lot of the business plans are not where they would like to be. So you need to access the secondary market. Uh, long term, it might not be the best option, as, as Steve was saying before. And this is a problem with incentivization of services. However, uh, the secondary market will happen. It was also part of the original business plans, perhaps at a lower level, but it was part of the business plans, or at least most of them. Uh, so we will see in the coming months a significant um, action in the, in the secondary market. So we'll go from the big deals that we had the last five years or so to smaller and uh, less, I think, uh, earth-shattering deals. They will not do much for for the uh, books of the, of the banks, but uh, they will uh, help a lot with uh, reaching our performance targets and also diversifying the servicing market. So one of the issues in, in uh, performance is that we need more specialization. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, services cannot 
in most cases, do everything, or at least cannot do everything at the same level of quality. So uh, there will be some diversification, there will be specialization, and I dare say some collaboration as well between the servicing community. Uh, this, I think, is necessary if we are to reach the potential uh, that uh, the books that we are managing have. Also, what is very important is that we don't stop investing both in new technology. As my 10-year-old daughter can tell you, I'm not the person to talk about new technology, but uh, it's an area that we need to continue investing, and it just, it's not just you know, digital platforms and sexy things like that. It's even more mundane operations like automating your back office, for example, and uh, making sure that uh, you're efficient and your operations run smoothly, things that are not so easy as uh, you know, people are finding out. Uh, but the most important thing is that we need better and more people. And uh, I think that was not obvious when the servicing market started because we had the banks and all their uh, voluntary exit schemes and we thought that uh, this will uh, be enough to populate our uh, organizations. And in, in a way it was. But uh, I think we need to start debunking our operations. Uh, we need to attract new talent which is something that the banks have not been doing for 15 years or so now. Uh, we need to train people at different standards of performance. And uh, this is quite challenging. You know, in a country that has still a significant unemployment problem, our sector is missing important skills and uh, we need to invest significantly on producing uh, on, you know, training and, and, and uh, improving the people that work for us. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, this is linked to the secondary market because, as I said before, it will require some extra skills. Um, for example, we may be quite good at negotiating solutions with borrowers, especially the viable ones. We're not that good at finding solutions for the non-viable ones and especially on uh, liquidating assets. We need to invest a lot in this area. Uh, as, as Dimitri said, liquidity is important and somebody has to provide liquidity. I think we will find solutions for the liquidity problem, but we need to have credible plans uh, and uh, focus on areas of the business that are not our first priority. Um, I think that what you mentioned about judicial performance, uh, even the legal framework, they can be improved further. Sure. But I think that we first need to look internally and improve our operations, improve our people and our technology. Mm -hmm. We cannot wait for everything to be perfect in order to improve our performance. We have to do it now. So you, you single out the people issue. Oh, I mean, yes. You talk again and again about it. And I'd like to ask, do you consider yourselves as digital champions? Yes, we're doing a lot. We're investing a lot compared to our size. We invest probably more than anybody else in, in uh, technology. This also because of you know, the fact that we are, uh, we are related to uh, a big technology provider in the area. However, I think no one is a digital champion. Uh, we are still, as a market, significantly behind the level that we need to, to reach. And uh, this is an area that uh, we are trying to improve. We are investing a lot of money. Uh, but uh, I think we have not seen the levels of, uh, of improvement yet we can reach. And not just on the digital platforms and you know, a way to reach customers better. I think what's more important is automation. Uh, we've seen a lot of improvement in various of our processes through uh, the use of technology. And also it's a solution to the big people issue, uh, I said before. Uh, you cannot expect to keep throwing people at a problem, which was what we were doing as banks. Mm -hmm. you know, banks, 
when we had issues with NPLs, our main go-to solution was move people to the NPL unit and we'll find a way to do it. Okay. Uh, we cannot do that any longer. So one is improve the people we have and what we can get from the market. The other is automate our processes and make uh, do with what we have. Thank you, Frixos. Steve, I think the question to you regarding the secondary market is, will you be advising your investors to come in? How do you see it? I mean, we, <clears throat> we already invest in the secondary market, so we, we see a big opportunity there for the reasons that we talked about earlier. Um, we actually do that with our own capital as well. So I think that helps show skin in the game to investors. So there's definitely an opportunity. Um, I, I haven't seen a lack of capital coming in primary or secondary markets. So I think, <laughs> going back again to the, to the GACs and the HAPs, I mean, I think one of the original objectives was, oh, we need to bring new investors in. You know, there's not enough investors, but I've never, I've never experienced that personally. I've always seen capital available, uh, equity, MES, even senior capital. It's always been there. So I think the idea that, um, you know, you needed to feed this... Uh, beast to bring in new investors that weren't there, uh, to me, it, uh, I haven't seen that. I mean, there's really, I think, if anything, it's done the opposite. There's a couple of investors that are monopolizing that market, so I don't think it's enlarged. So yeah, I mean, uh, secondary market, definitely, I would advise investors to come in. It's something where you have the opportunity, of course, to, um, I, I don't want to say cherry pick, but really analyze and focus on what you're buying and buying sub-segments of portfolios. You're not buying a huge... Uh, you know, carve out from a bank or a large portfolio. So there's obvious advantages. Uh, there's obvious disadvantages as well because the, the seller has probably got a better view on performance and knows the assets well. So you're not going to get those kind of, um, you know, a great sort of uh, jewels that the, the seller maybe wasn't aware of. Um, I don't know if this is true in Greece, but in Italy we have a couple of complications around the secondary market. In particular, I'm thinking of, um, of the Rioco because managing particularly real estate backed portfolios, that's a key, key tool. I mean, without the real estate, you know, w without the Rioja being able to participate and defend your loans in auction, it's uh, you lose value. I mean, that's basically how it is. And there are significant tax subsidies for that vehicle. We, we got there over time. So actually, this is one of the things I think we were talking about it the other day that I'm surprised that there isn't a very tax efficient Rioja structure, which is coupled to the SPV that allows you to use debt assumption, it, it holds the assets below the line. So really it's seen as protecting the creditor. In secondary transactions in Italy, you lose some of those um, benefits. So actually what's happened is the secondary markets have additional restrictions, which yes, it's not the primary market, but obviously a cascade of issues then gets priced into the, the transaction that can affect the primary market. So I think there's, there's pros and cons, but clearly, you know, we do it ourselves. We see the opportunity and I think I would, uh, I would advise investors to, to invest. Both old and new investors, right? Yes, I mean, the risk of new investors is, uh, going back to the technology point, which I fully agree with, I do think it's a bit of a false friend. Sometimes you need to be careful. I mean, you, you've obviously invested a lot into technology. You know, sometimes I hear like, you know, oh, we've got this new technology and we can price a portfolio in seven seconds and we know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that work. I mean, unfortunately, we've always, always have a manual element to this. You know, we've got a database. This, you know, there's a robot and he teaches the other robot and pff, here's the price. I've never actually seen that work without a significant amount of manual adjustment. So I think you do need to be a little bit careful. Um, so new investors coming in can, can obviously take risks. But again, the GAX a little bit did that. Investors came in and they, they weren't aware of the market. They made investments, they knew they were going to lose some, win some others, and they got a position in the market, a foot in the door. So from a certain perspective, I think that makes sense. So, but yeah, I would advise both. I mean, I think there's still opportunity. You need to look carefully and, and, and do your work, but yeah. Okay, so you leave us with an optimistic view as well regarding the secondary market. Dimitris, do you agree with all that? Um, well, I think every, every point made was <laughs> uh, brought by experience and what people have uh, experience of, certainly. Uh, the, um, what I would like to sort of point out are a number of challenges that the, both the securitization and the market will need to face in the future. And um, I think on the securitization side, um, um, in, in Italy, if I understand well, 
the business plan are outperformed, sorry, are underperformed by a significant percentage now. So I think it is something that um, both the regulatory environment and the services and all you know, participants, including the state, of course, who has provided the, the guarantees, needs to look at. And, uh, but we need to stick to the original uh, principles. And the principle, uh, as Steve mentioned, was that we need to have the best or the, the, the best recovery potential over a longer term, not just what sort of suits uh, the parameters that uh, sort of uh, uh, delimit us. Uh, so that's one big challenge that we're going to have to face, and we need to start working on it early so that we don't you know, end up with some hasty decisions that come into place you know, uh, uh, at the time of the crisis hits. So that's one thing. That's, uh, the, the, the next thing is uh, I believe um, there needs to be a, a lot more, and that's sort of tackling the people's problem as well, um, is that there, there needs to be a lot more um, cultivation or development of the ecosystem. And um, this is something that will take a bit of time. Uh, the, the, the market of services as it stands today has got uh, uh, three and one, uh, one major participants and a number of other uh, services that are on the sidelines managing their parents' portfolios or uh, some portfolios that they sort of manage to, um, to attract us in, in their, in their uh, business. But I think there has to be a lot more uh, now that the secondary market is uh, coming into place, there has to be a lot more, uh, let's say, uh, collaboration. Not necessarily in the sense of, you know, colluding to do something bad, but actually to work towards, uh, you know, enhancing the capacity of the market to deal with things. And as uh, Frixo said, that the specialization uh, will certainly help towards that. For example, we are a firm that specializes in corporate, small, large, and medium. And uh, that's something that we want to continue doing in the future. We don't want to build uh, significant infrastructures to deal with, uh, um, with problems. Um, now, one, one more thing I'd like to sort of point out um, uh, in, in the discussion is the, um, is, is the funding of the solution. Uh, and I agree with Steve that there is an abundance of capital that comes in to invest in uh, portfolios that are being transacted in one way or another. Um, the, the, the secondary level of that uh, funding that comes in to actually provide, let's say, uh, funding for the acquisition of a property that is, you know, that is not, ha has not been used for the past six years because nobody has done anything about it in order to recover it. Um, and this is a, it's, it's a smaller sort of, uh, not as big a financing, and it's a smaller thing, and that I haven't seen it developing yet. So I think this is something that we do need, and we somehow I think it's going to develop in the future. And that's a, an opportunity as well for those people that are going to be participating in that market. Um, and the uh, last thing is um, uh, I, still, I still believe that um, uh, the banks, um, although they have uh, uh, sort of now they are in a better uh, condition, I think there, is a, there needs to be a lot, a lot more time before they can actually finance uh, the second sort of what will be created out of our industry. And that's something that uh, will take some time. Um, so. so Dimitri, I think you've summarized most of the points uh, all our speakers raised. I'd like to um, finish with the collaboration issue. This is something that makes me very optimistic. Um, coming from a big servicer saying that we realize that we don't do everything the best way and that we are not at our top performance. We are looking into collaborations to do things better. This is very important. Might I say that this is music to our ears, being a smaller sort of... Yes, 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 <laughs> you, you certainly might. I think we've taken up all of our time. Uh, for any questions we can meet afterwards, I'd like to thank very much my panel. Thank you all so much. Thank it's you. been a pleasure talking to you now and before. Thank you to our audience, and we'll be open for questions later on. Thank you very much.